This is a lecture from Open Tuition. Okay, yeah, I'm going to work through uh, Crockett Co. from the September December 2020 exam. And so uh, let's look first of all at the scenario, but a very, very brief look. Never spend uh, much time reading the scenario until you've looked to see what the requirements are. So I'll have a quick read of the scenario. It says Crockett Company is a manufacturing company that has three investment decisions for the coming year. There's investment decision one, and quite a lot of information there, obviously. Then there's investment decision two, uh, not much there, but we'll read it later. And then investment decision three. Uh, again, there's a bit of reading to do later. However, as I said, don't spend time reading the scenario in detail until you've looked at what is actually required. And so, part A, the first two requirements, it says for investment decision one, calculate the MPV of project B and given the capital constraint, blah, blah, blah. But that's only, those two parts are only for investment decision one. Over the page, in, uh, requirement B, for investment decision two, explain something, but that's only for investment decision two. And over the page again, part C, in relation to investment decision three, describe something. So the examiner has been very kind. It's almost like three separate questions. Investment decision one, two and three. And the information is split. Investment decision one, two and three. So let's start on part A. Part A is only for investment decision one. So we're only interested in this bit of the scenario. And what does he want? Calculate the NPV of project B and then something to do with capital constraint. So let's look just at investment decision one. Six investment projects are being considered with the following details. So there we are, six projects, A to F. We know the initial cost, the initial outlay, and we've been given the net present values with the exception of project B. And of course, part one of the requirement is for us to calculate the MPV of B. And how are we going to do it? Well, we know the initial cost, 1500 And below, it's told us that it's expected to generate the following annual cash flows. So there we are, the sales, the costs. However, the little complication below it says, Project B cash flows are before allowing for inflation, of 4% a year for sales income and 5% a year for costs and there's a nominal cost of capital of 10%. Now, okay, there's a bit more here. Due to management reluctance to raise new finance, capital is restricted. Well, if you read the requirements initially, um, that for the moment is irrelevant Part 1 simply wants the MPV of Project B. It's only Part 2 that talks about this capital constraint, this capital restriction. So we can ignore the last paragraph for the moment. So let's work out the MPV for B. So let's set up our years. There are th uh, four years. One, two, three, four. We need the cash flows, so first of all the sales, but of course they've given us the nominal, the actual cost of capital. And so what we need are the nominal or the actual cash flows, the normal way of dealing with inflation. Uh, we've been given the flows without inflation to get the actual cash flows. We need to inflate those figures. And for sales, 
write it down then, it's obvious to the mark what I'm doing. For sales, the inflation is 4%. So let's go through and inflate them. Uh, now I know you can use formulae on the spreadsheet, and I will do later, but this bit, I actually think that rather than mess around creating something on the spreadsheet, it's easier to use your calculator uh, or the built-in calculator. I'll use my calculator, and so time one, it's 725, but we need to inflate. So 4% multiplied by 1.04, which gives me 754. At time two, well, 765, but we need two years inflation. So multiply by 1.04 twice. 827. At time three, from the scenario 885, but three years inflation, so 1.04 cubed, 996. And at time four, 612, four years inflation at 4%, 716. So, no problem. Uh, but of course we've also got the costs, and so in exactly the same way, except the inflation on the costs is, what, 5%? Uh, so at uh, time one, one four five, but inflation, so multiply by 1.05, and I get 152. At time two, 168 times 1.05 squared, 185. At time three, 202, 1.05 cubed, 234. And finally at time four, 94, 1.05, four times, 114. So, there are the operating flows and the net operating flows. Can't spell. Well, here, obviously, I will use the spreadsheet. Uh, the net cash flow is the sales income minus the costs. So at time one, six zero two. Uh, it's obviously the same arithmetic for uh, each of the remaining three years, so I'll copy and paste. Copy. Paste. And so fine, there's the net operating cash flow. Any other cash flows? Well, uh, there's obviously the uh, initial cost, which I'll bring in separately. The other one to always look for is working capital, but there's no mention here of working capital. So forget that. So let's work out the present value of those flows. And I'll use the spreadsheet formula equals, sorry, equals NPV. Uh, the discount rate, well, the cost of capital, the actual cost of capital is 10% or 0.1. And then highlight the flows that we want the present value of. Close brackets. And there we are. Uh, now, I don't think you'd lose marks, but it doesn't look very pretty to leave it as 2061.527218. So, you know, keep things in thousands. And so let's see if we can do that. There we are. Using that button, the zero, zero one. 
you know, and you, uh, we could have chosen to do it to two decimal places, but since everything else is in thousands, leave it in thousands. So there's the present value of the inflows. Uh, we've also, though, got the initial cost. We've given that in the question, where is it? Initial, initial outlay, 1500. And therefore, the net present value is 2062 minus the initial outflow, 1500. And see, it's done it again, this is so annoying. <laughs> But let's again see if we can get it to so custom number apply. There we are, five six two. And because that's the final answer to part one, I will ha I think it looks neater if I just put them in bold. It's not critical, but there we are. Okay, well that was part one, but let's now turn to part two. I better just let the marker know that I'm doing part two. Okay, I'll make it bold. Now what does it say? Given the capital constraint, calculate the optimum investment combination and the resulting NPV. Well, what's it mean by that? If you look back to the um, final paragraph of investment one, due to management reluctance to raise new finance, capital for investment in the above projects is currently restricted to five million. And at a quick look, and I don't need to waste time adding, um, it's impossible to do all six projects because in total it would need more than five million. Uh, a, B, D and F are all independent, but projects C and D are mutually exclusive. And what that means is if we do C, we can't do E. And if we do E, we can't do C. We can only do one of the two. All of the above projects are divisible and none can be delayed or repeated. Well, I assume you've been watching my lectures so you know what we mean by divisible projects. It means that we can do fractions of projects. We can do half of Project A if we want. A quarter of Project A. We can do any fraction of those projects. And this should be something you're very familiar with. It's a very standard approach. We decide which is the best, the second best and so on project based on the profitability index, the net present value per dollar invested. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, project, oh. oh, I'm not showing you very well. Project. Let's list them. Uh, A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, we know the initial outlay. A thousand, fifteen hundred. 750, 1125, 1850, 1300. Uh, we know the MPVs, uh, 390. B, we had to work out and it's 562. Uh, and incidentally, as always in the exam, if something had gone wrong, in part one, and you'd got a different NPV, then in part two, using your NPV, if you've done everything else correctly, you can still get full marks for part two. You don't lose marks twice. 
Anyway, let's carry on. C from the question. The MPV is 325. Uh, D590. E840. Uh, F635. Now remember the capital's limited, so we're not going to be able to do all the projects. And we rank them on the profitability index. You don't need to use that word. But the profitability index is the net present value per dollar invested. And so how are we going to calculate it? For project A, the MPV is 390, 1,000 invested. So for every a dollar invested, it's 390 divided by 1,000. So I can use the spreadsheet formulae. It's the NPV divided by, uh, sorry, I should have used equals. I do apologize. The NPV divided by the initial outlay. 0.39. And it's the same for all of them, so let's just copy and paste uh, the formula. Copy, paste, and bleh. here I want to go to two decimal places. I'm not going to mess around with all of those. So using that one again, not, not, there we are. So there's the MPV per pound, uh, per dollar, and we should invest on the basis of whichever's the highest. The highest is 0.52. So we want to invest as much as we can in D, but we are limited to the 11.25. Remaining cash, we go to the next best and so on. So let's rank them. Just let's put them in order. The best at 52 cents per pound, uh, dollar is D. The second best at 49 cents per dollar is F. The third best is E. The fourth best is C. Fifth best is A. And the sixth best is B. I hope I've got them in the right order. And so that's the order in which we'll invest. Uh, so how much shall we invest in each? Well, D is um, the best at 0.52. So we'll invest as much as we can, which is 11.25. It says the projects are divisible, but it says none can be repeated. So the most you can invest is 1125. And so how much MPV are we getting? We're investing in all of D. The MPV is therefore 590. Well, of course, we've plenty of cash left. Remember, there's five million, and these are in thousands. So effectively, there's 5,000. We've only invested 11.25. So go to the next best, which is F. That one needs 1,300. So no problem. We'll invest in all of F and the MPV 635. If we invest in all of F, we get all the MPV. Keep tabs on how much we're using. Uh, at the moment, I'm using 11.25 plus 1,300. So we're using 2425. There was 5,000 available. So I've still got 2575 left. So let's carry on. What's the next best? E. We've got enough, 18.50. We'll invest in all of E. And we'll get all the NPV of 840. So how much invested so far? 1125 plus 1850 plus 1300. 2610. 
can't be. 1125 plus 1850 plus 1300. 4275, we're getting close, aren't we? So with 4275, there was 5,000 available. We've got 725 left. So 725 left. And let's check, yes, that invests the whole 5,000. But what about the MPV? Um, the, uh, to do the whole of A would uh, cost a thousand. It is divisible, so we can do uh, fractions, and we've ended up only investing seventy-two. Sorry, from that seven hundred twenty-five, which is seventy-two point five percent, and seventy-two point five percent. It means we'll only get seventy-two point five percent of the MPV of three ninety. So 390 times 72.5% is 283. So there's how we're going to invest. It'll be 100% of uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, of F, but of course we'll in, we haven't enough money left, we'll invest nothing in the other two. And so finally, what is the resulting NPV? The total of those, I get two, three, four, eight. And again, I'll, hide, I'll make them bold and it's clear to the marker. And so there we are. I mean, um, all right, in total, that's 10 marks. In the exam, at 1.8 minutes per mark, that should take 18 minutes. It's taken me longer uh, because I've been trying to talk through and explain at the same time. But I don't think that's too bad. And of course, that's 50% of the marks before we go on to part B and C. And it's 50% you need. So provided we've got that right, anything we get in the next two bits is going to be a bonus uh, and make absolutely sure we pass the question. Okay, well, ha having sorted out part A of the question, now let's look at part B. Uh, which, as I said before, is effectively completely separate. Whether part A was easy or hard, or whether we got it right or wrong, part B is simply referring to investment decision two. And it says, explain the approach Crockett Co. should use to determine the optimum replacement cycle for the company car fleet. And so let's look at investment decision two in the scenario. A number of Crockett Co's employees have a company car. The entire company car fleet is now due for renewal and in the past has been replaced every four years. Management are not sure if this is the optimum length of time and feel that other fleet replacement cycles such as every three or every five years should also be considered. So here we're not asked to do any arithmetic at all. We're purely asked to explain the approach. How do we go about deciding whether it should be every three years or keep to every four years or every five years? Now, I'm not going to type out an answer in full uh, for three reasons. Uh, partly, uh, you've got a, a printed answer from the ACCA website. So you can read the answer yourself. Uh, secondly, this is all explained in detail in my free lectures, and I assume you've watched the lectures on replacement. Uh, and thirdly, just to watch me typing it all out uh, is going to be boring. Um, so what I'll type is just the main points and the way I would approach it. 
what I would always do is just set out the steps we take. Uh, and if you remember, for each of uh, the possible cycles, uh, which here it's three years or stick to the four uh, the years that we do at the moment or five year. This is why I said I'm not going to type out the whole thing because that's going to be ages. Uh, what are the steps? The first step is calculate the present value of one cycle, i.e. one replacement. Uh, leave a, a space, I'll tell you why in a minute. But once we've got the present value, which I haven't spelled right, of uh, one cycle, uh, then to make them comparable, you know, having if it's three year, having got the present value, it's that amount every three years. Otherwise, with four years, it's whatever we come to every four years. So, for each, calculate the equivalent annual cost. And how do we calculate the equivalent annual cost? By dividing the present value of one cycle by the relevant annuity factor. And when we've done it, how do we decide which is the best? Well, because these are costs, choose the replacement cycle with the smallest equivalent annual cost. And again, you don't lose marks of spelling mistakes. Equivalent, that's right, yeah. Now those are the three main steps. I think to get the full marks though, you need to say a little bit more uh, about each step. And it depends how much time you've got available. Remember, there's only four marks here, and just what I've done there would get most of the four. But remember, with the word processor, you can always add more space and take space away. And so having written down the three steps, just say a little bit more of each. Uh, you know, for example, uh, the first step, how would we do it? set up the cash flows for one replacement uh, and discount at the cost of capital. Uh, step two, um, calculate the equivalent annual cost. Well, I've said how we do it, but do. You know, if, again, if you have time, uh, give a few words as to why this is in order uh, to make them comparable. We've ca uh, we will have calculated the equivalent cost per year. And finally, and then I will end up having effectively written a full answer as far as I'm concerned. Choose the... Uh, I've spelled it wrong again. Choose the replacement cycle with the smallest equivalent cost and why this will be the cheapest way of replacing.
Now, it is effectively a full answer, uh, but again, if I had time, but bear in mind it's only four marks, um, and I've certainly got most, if not all, of those four marks here, but if I did have time, although it's not specifically asked for, I would mention the one or one of the biggest problems uh, with any solution we come to is that this does assume that the costs of one cycle will stay constant in the future. I mean, we could go on and on here, but as you remember from our lectures, uh, the problem is that in, um, you know, if we carry on doing this uh, every three years or every four years, well, maybe in 10 years' time, the costs are completely different. The costs of buying a new car, the costs of repairing it and things will have changed. Or the same cars may not be available. We may be having to use different cars, uh, and that will mean uh, automatically the costs will all be completely different. So... I mean, uh, very briefly there, but I, you know, I'm not going to give a full lecture on replacement here. You've got a free lecture available if you haven't already watched it. Uh, but otherwise, I think that provided you have studied uh, the syllabus, that's a very easy four marks. Finally, though, part C. This again only relates to decision three two approaches for dealing with inflation and a reasoned recommendation as to which approach they should follow. So let's read decision three. The management uh, of Crockett Co are considering financial viability of another project, but as yet no detailed financial available is available uh, to perform the MPV appraisal. One of the reasons for this is that the various cash flows will be subject to a number of different rates of inflation that are very uncertain. Uh, for example, the selling price inflation may be no more than 2% a year, whereas material cost inflation could be anything from 4 to 6% a year. The general rate of inflation is expected to differ from both of these. So, a bit like investment decision one, in that there are different rates of inflation uh, for different cash flows. Sales, no more than 2%. Materials, 4 to 6%. And the general, the overall rate of inflation, is expected to differ from both. And they're not sure whether the appraisal could be performed by simply ignoring inflation altogether. And the question says, describe two approaches for dealing with inflation. Now be careful, because they mention material cost inflation could be anything from 4 to 6%. It starts to make me think of dealing with uncertainty, but it's not asking about uncertainty. It's the two approaches for dealing with inflation. And the two approaches are, uh, one approach... is, as we did um, with investment decision one, uh, calculate the nominal cash flows by applying the inflation, the relevant inflation rates, and then discount at the nominal or actual cost of capital. I don't know what's gone wrong with me today. My spelling's atrocious. It's the keyboard, I think. It's gone wrong again there. Nominal. Uh, so that's one approach, and that's the approach that we used uh, with investment decision one. The other approach Uh, 
uh, is to take the real cash flows, which are the cash flows ignoring inflation, And if we uh, are taking the real cash flows without inflation, we then discount at the real cost of capital. And the real cost of capital is ignoring inflation. So there's your two approaches. Uh, it then says though, provide a reasoned uh, recommendation as to which approach they should follow. Well, <coughs> the problem is this. The second approach uh, is only valid if everything inflates at the same general rate of inflation. The general rate of inflation is the overall inflation rate in the country. And it's the general rate of inflation that determines the actual and nominal cost of capital. And again, if I'm saying this too briefly, um, I do illustrate this in full with an example uh, in my free lectures. So I'm not going to repeat all the lectures here. Uh, and for that reason, again, you can easily add in a few more words, you know, if you've got the time. Uh, and because of that, when it says provide a reasoned recommendation as to which approach they should follow, well, because uh, cash flows are expected to inflate at rates different from the general rate, The recommended approach is the first approach. Discount the nominal cash flows at the nominal cost of capital. And there we are. And so again, uh, read the uh, printed answer if you're at all unsure about what I've been saying, uh, watch my free lecture on um, inflation. But otherwise, uh, that certainly should get me most, if not all, uh, of the six marks available. And just as a general final point, as I keep stressing all the way through, not just on this question, do make sure you've done something for each part of a question. You know, you only need 50% to pass. Uh, don't end up spending all your time just on part A. I know that can get you 10 marks, but there's, you're so likely to have made a mistake somewhere that you can't rely uh, on that. It's better not to quite finish uh, part A, but to have done something for parts B and C, even if it's only one or two lines. But, you know, writing anything for B and C, uh, that's at all sensible, will get you one or two marks, however uh, little you write. You must do something for every part of every question. You'll get your 50%. Anything above that's a bonus, uh, but you've passed the question.